a life of eternity. We've previously listened to lectures given in this hall which outline the other great Bible promises, a land to live in and a king to rule for eternity. Tonight we come to our final study in this series and consider the great promise of eternal life, the promise which enables man to receive and enjoy the previous promises in unending joy. You are all most likely familiar in some shape or form with the concept of eternal life. Tonight, our structure will flow as follows. Firstly, we will use the Bible as a guide to understand what this subject entails. We will then explore the common religious views of the world on the subject, and we will then compare them to the Bible. And to conclude, we will discover why man is in need of eternal life and, why and how and when this great promise is to occur. To begin, our subject is one of the three great promises of the Bible, a life of eternity. And if we break that into its specific sections, we conclude eternity means unending. By life is intended a full, perfect and renewed revealing of the mental, moral and physical faculties of man or woman. And by promise of the Bible is signified something confirmed by God, but yet to be possessed. Therefore, we can expand our subject heading in the following way. The possession of the mental, moral and physical powers of man or woman in full, perfect and unending manifestation is the subject of a Bible promise from God which is yet to be realised. The promise of eternal life is often referred to in religious terms as the Edemic promise because it has its origins in the Garden of Eden. However, Whilst, it's or it, whilst it originated in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, as we've read this evening, it is a theme which runs throughout all the Bible, and tonight we will look at some of the other areas in the Bible this wonderful promise of redemption and life eternal is mentioned. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. In Titus chapter 1 verses 1 to 2, Paul again writes, Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, in the hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before the world began. And in 1 John 2 verse 25, this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Now these are just a few sections in the Bible which express the doctrine of the promise of eternal life. The Bible teaches us that God has made a promise of eternal life and his faithful servants are in hope of it coming to pass. Before pursuing this doctrine further, let us realise what is the teaching of the present day with respect to the question of eternal life. We are all most probably familiar with the idea of eternal life. We have been taught by the world around us that we already have, by nature, a life that cannot end. That we have a part in our makeup which is immortal and cannot die. If we hold this idea or believe in some way it is correct, we would certainly come to the conclusion that eternal life is a condition and has nothing to do with the idea of existence or non-existence. The term expresses to the popular mind the idea of a state, not of being, a condition, not existence. The popular doctrine of today is focused around the phrase immortality of the soul. Now of great importance, first and foremost, this phrase is entirely absent from the word of God. It is not contained anywhere in the Bible. There is also an absence entirely of other phrases which give a similar idea, such as deathless spirit, immortal soul, never dying soul, and immortal being. These results are from a Bible app with a search function. As you can see, all searches return a zero result. These terms and phrases are never found in the Bible. Most people, at first impulse, will immediately declare this to be false and probably pro proclaim me to be a fool. That this doctrine is so widely taught throughout the world that it must certainly be contained in the Bible. 
But if you set the task to search it out, and with the wonders of technology, as you can see, you're able to do so with a few clicks on the keyboard of your smartphone, you'll find my statement is correct. There are no such phrases contained in the Word of God, the Bible. Now, I appreciate these comments may be confronting. Any reasonable person would demand some explanation to the circumstances of why a phrase, which is continually used by the religious teachers of the world, a form of speech and a doctrine, which are so prominent in popular teaching, but are not met with in the book in which they believe they owe their religious faith to. No real reason has or can be provided than this simple conclusion. The immortality of the soul and its various teachings are in fact the doctrines of the vain imaginations of the heart of man and are not from God. Now once this confronting idea has been absorbed, the next logical conclusion would be to ask, what does the Bible actually teach? What is the doctrine of eternal life according to the Bible? The first place to begin would be to consider what is meant by life. And the best way to understand this idea, I believe, is to consider what the Bible teaches about death, its opposite. We're told in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. But what was this death that came by man, which is spoken of by Paul? And if we if we can ascertain the true facts connected with the man by whom death came, we'll therefore be able to find out the nature and relation to death for ourselves as we have descended from him. If we turn back to Genesis chapter 3, which we was read for us tonight, we'll consider the sentence delivered upon Adam. Here in this chapter, we are told the consequences that have come about by Adam and Eve's disobedience of God's commandment. Here we will find out what is meant by the Bible term death, and this will help us, hopefully, to understand the Bible teaching of life and eternal life. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 19, we read, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it what's thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Putting aside the common teachings of today, I believe it is important to consider the simple and intelligent words of the Bible on the subject to gain the true understanding intended. We will start by noting that the material out of which man was created was not some immaterial sub spirit, which is commonly preached, but rather he came from the dust. We are told in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, if you'll turn there with me please, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man, that is the man which was made from the dust of the earth, became a living soul. Let's first consider the word man. In biblical Hebrew, the word is Adama and means dust, earth and clay. This shows us the very generic name of our race is evidence of our origins. We are originally from the dust. This is shown for us again by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 47, where he writes, the first man is of the earth, earthy. Now, some might interject here that the statement made in the second half of the verse, Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, shows the common idea of the immortality of the soul is true. The term God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that is most commonly imagined that this idea carries with it some grand link to God putting into the body of the dust an immortal principle. If we look a little into the subject, we will see the foolishness of such a conclusion. The breath of life is not the man. It is simply the principle of life which enables him to be. The point is further set forth when we consider other Bible passages which speak of this idea of breath of life and find that it is how animals are described. In Genesis chapter 7 verse 15, we read, they, that is the animals, went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Now this verse clearly shows us that the animals also have this breath of life. It must therefore be concluded, I concluded either this breath of life has no relation to eternal life, or the beasts and animals are immortal. 
This idea obviously is not to be considered. Therefore, the first statement must stand. When we read then that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, we are not to understand by this that God breathed into him an immortal principle, but merely that he breathed into him that which made him a living creature. But some might suggest the final words in the verse in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 must clearly show that man is immortal. The verse states that once God had breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, man became a living soul. The first com comment on this is that a living soul is not necessarily an ever-living soul. There is a vast distinction between living and ever-living. The next remark we make is much the same as was outlined in the, with the term breath of life. The same phrase is used elsewhere in the Bible to describe animals and beasts. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 21 we read, And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth. The word living creature in the original is exactly the same word as those applied to Adam and translated as living soul. This is further supported by the words of verse 30 in chapter 1 where it says, to every beast of the earth, to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for me. In the margin of an Oxford Bible, you will note the Hebrew word for life in the phrase, wherein there is life, is the term living soul. We find then that God uses the same exact language with regards to beast as to man in the Genesis record. It must be concluded then that the statement from that Adam became a living soul simply means he became a living creature. If anyone was to dispute that it meant he became an immortal soul, they must also conclude that beasts and animals are immortal souls as well. We have therefore in the early chapters of Genesis a creature of the ground, made of the dust, created in the image of God, placed in the Garden of Eden and given a commandment to obey. They were commanded, as we read, to not touch a certain tree located in the midst of the garden. What occurs after this, under seductions, we do not have time to consider this evening. But Adam and Eve disobey the commandment of God. Adam is then called into the divine presence to hear the consequence of his transgression. As we had read for us in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of, his, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. This is what Paul has styled death in his writings we mentioned before, a resolution of man to go to his original dust. We have now hopefully established so far tonight that the promise of the Bible is the possession of mental, moral, and physical powers of man or woman in full perfect, renewed and unending manifestation. And we've also concluded that within man is no immortal being, soul or any such thing. Man is made of the dust and as a result of Adam's transgression, all his descendants, which is every man and woman, are brought under the law of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, which concludes, dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. Following this statement by God in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, and in turn all mankind, have become corruptible creatures who are under a state of sin and death. Man is in need of this promise of eternal life which is given in the Bible because the Bible tells us God has made promises to those who are faithful to God's words and these promises involve an inheritance forever. For example, a few weeks ago there was a lecture given from this platform regarding the promises made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 15 where we read for all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever therefore Abraham was a creature of the dust yet he received these promises it is required then that God would grant him to have eternal life in order to obtain the promise of inheriting the land forever we are also told in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 to 29, For as many of you have been baptised into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. 
for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Therefore, if you have been baptised into Christ, as the verse tells us, you can become a part of Abraham's seed, and an heir of the promise of receiving the land to dwell in forever, as given for us in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It must be concluded then that man requires this promise of eternal life not only to save him from the body of death which is bound to return to the dust, but he must also receive eternal life so he, if he is found worthy and faithful, can also partake of the promises given by God. With this finality which occurs to Adam and all his descendants upon their death, we might then ask, how is the Bible promise of eternal life available? The Bible sets forth that it can only come following a resurrection of the dead of all those who are responsible to God and is only given to those who are deemed worthy following judgment by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ himself states in John chapter 6 verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. This statement was made surrounding the death of Lazarus and can only apply to a literal resurrection. This literal resurrection has often been referred to in numerous times by Christ. For example, in John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, where he says, A day would come when the dead would hear the voice of the Son of Man and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation. It is important then to understand that the reward of the righteous is made in connection with the resurrection and the reward of the wicked and punishment of the wicked rather is made in connection with the resurrection. This idea is further illustrated by the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 16 verse 27 where he says, The Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father and his angels and then shall he reward every man according to his work. It is only after Christ returns to this earth the reward will occur. Only after a resurrection has occurred and judgment will there be reward or punishment given. It is to occur only after Christ has returned to the earth because we are told in 1 John 5 verse 11, and this is the record that God hath given us eternal life and this life is in his Son. This passage of the Bible shows us that eternal life is not within us, it is in his Son. We have no immortality in us, we are not immortal. It is only attained by us through Christ. We have for us in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, God hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And we are further shown by the words of Paul in Romans chapter 2, verse 7, that is a thing to be sought for, where we read, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour immortality. And as we have shown before, it is a thing promised. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, this is the promise that he hath promised us, us even eternal life. We conclude then that... A literal resurrection must occur before the promise of eternal life can be given to those who have been righteous. That this resurrection is to occur when Christ has returned and that this is when the promise of eternal life will be granted. The Bible therefore sets before men two great outcomes available. An unending return to the dust from whence he came or a resurrection from the dust if so required, as some may still be alive when Christ has returned, and a receiving of this wonderful promise of eternal life to all those who, have, who are found worthy and righteous. We read in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now we would logically, having considered the aforementioned ideas, desire to know how we are to obtain this promise of eternal life. To first understand what is required, we must understand that eternal life is a free gift of God. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 verse 23, but the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we are told in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The verses set forth that eternal life is a free gift from God and is therefore not inherent or derived from Adam in any way. It is a principle which is external to the constitution of man and if it were to be enjoyed by man, it could only be through the free and gracious gift of God. However, whilst it is a free gift from, of God through Jesus Christ to the world, it is nevertheless conditional. One asks of Christ how to obtain eternal life, and he explains in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. The person asks, Good Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Christ responds, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. We are told in Mark chapter 16, verse 16, He who believes and is baptised shall be saved. We are told further, Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And again in Romans chapter 2 verse 6 to 7. Who, God, will render to every man according to his deeds, to them by patient continuance in well-doing, seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. From those passages of the Bible, we conclude with certainty that eternal life is conditional and can only be obtained by those who conform to certain fixed and unalterable requirements of God. And it will be rendered unto every man when Christ is once again in the earth. To conclude our lecture tonight then, we might summarise our material as follows. The Bible teaches us that the promise of eternal life involves the possession of mental, moral and physical powers of man or woman in full, perfect, renewed and unending manifestation and that is the subject of a Bible promise which God is yet to, from God which is yet to be realised. The common understanding of the religious world concerning the immortality of the soul and other such ideas are not based upon the Bible. Man requires the promise of eternal life because there is nothing immortal within him. Man is a creature of the dust and following the transgression of God's law by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they and all mankind after them were condemn condemned to return to the dust from whence they are taken. For dust thou art and unto dust shalt thou return. The outcome then of not receiving the promise of eternal life is an unending return to the dust. We conclude that the promise of eternal life is only to occur following the return of Jesus Christ and a resurrection of those responsible from the grave in judgment of every man's works. That the promise of eternal life is a free gift of God, that though it is a free gift from God, it is conditional upon the obedience of the requirements which God has set forth in his Bible. Whilst our subject might be extended further this evening, I believe what we have set forth tonight will serve its purpose if it excites you to further study the Bible. As we have amply shown tonight, it is the only standard of wisdom in divine matters. We must therefore hold fast to the word of God, for within its pages are the commandments required to be followed if we are to obtain unto that wonderful promise of the Bible even everlasting life.